Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I am so excited to be here with our guest today. Um, so a lot of people uh, talk about wanting to meet their uh, you know, rock star or a celebrity, but for me as a philosophy student, as a Thomist, this is my celebrity. This is the person that I really look up to, and I just can't attest enough to how amazing uh, Dr. Robert Coons' work has been. Uh, but I think I should hold back a little bit. So today, <laughs> today we're going to talk about uh, Aristotelianism, morality, and then in, in particular, uh, a few applied ethics and uh, political theory issues around that ballpark range there, basically conservatism from a Thomas perspective. So uh, Dr. Coons, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, so I teach at the University of Texas at Austin. Been there 32 years now. Uh, studied at uh, Michigan State, Oxford, UCLA, uh, specialized in metaphysics, philosophy of religion, philosophical logic. I think that's basically it. <laughs> basically a renaissance man. Six. Like you have yeah. all of it down. All right. Yeah, I can't ever settle down to one thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go to really where I think uh, a lot of your work has been concentrated, which is Aristotelianism. So yeah. before we get into Aristotelianism, could you provide us with just a definition of metaphysics and why metaphysics matters? Yeah, so I'll, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think of metaphysics. Uh, everybody, different people have different definitions. Um, so for me, it really encompasses three things. First of all, a very general theory about about things and what exists and how it exists. What does it mean for something to exist? And what does it mean for it to be a certain way? Uh, secondly, uh, natural theology. So what's the ultimate reality? How can we know it? And then finally, uh, I would include what I would call philosophy of nature. So a kind of reflection about things that underlie our knowledge of nature. So uh, questions about uh, cause, cause and effect, time, space, parts and holes, things like that. Oh, by the way, Dr. Coons, uh, I think your uh, microphone on your headphones is kind of rubbing against your collar, so you okay. might have to move it a little bit. Yeah, there we go. That might help. Yeah. All right, so metaphysics is the study of basically the nature of reality, all these different components of reality. And in particular, some people might be wondering, well, you know, what is its relevance to ethics? And before we get to that question, I'm interested in, First, your approach to metaphysics, right, which obviously flows into your ethics. But first, yeah. what is Aristotelianism? And is there a special reason why, you know, you've been called a neo-Aristotelian? Is there like a classical Aristotelianism you're trying to distinguish yourself from? Yeah, so that's, that's, actually, that's a good question. No one, I don't know really anybody ever asking me that question about the neo-Aristotelianism before. So I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that. Um, well, so of course there were, and I think it goes back to the ancient Greeks, obviously. And uh, it's not just Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and even some of the pre-Socratics. But Aristotle, I think, um, pulled it all together into a single really coherent, really compelling system of the world. So, uh, so everyone who calls themselves an Aristotelian thinks of Aristotle as their, their sort of master and teacher in this area. Um, you're right. I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of Aristotelian metaphysics, especially in the last 15 years or so. So I wasn't really, I wasn't really trained in this. I was trained in, in analytic philosophy of the mid 20th century, basically at, at UCLA, very heavy in logic and uh, uh, philosophy of science to some extent. Um, so it, it's been a gradual process for me where I would, uh, I've been working on, on some of these questions, especially about causation and parts and holes and that sort of thing. And, and, and as I felt I was making some progress, getting a little more understanding, I kept finding that Aristotle was there before me, that I, I'd reach an opinion or reach a conclusion and say, oh, wait, that's, that's actually what Aristotle thought. <laughs> and so at some point I started looking at Aristotle and saying, well, maybe this could be a useful guide in thinking, thinking these, these things. And I found he is. He's really is an incredibly good knack at getting to the fundamental truths about, about reality. So, uh, so I, I really do uh, consider myself an Aristotelian now. Now about the Neo, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I, think, I think that what I would say about that is, is I would really classify anybody who's doing Aristotelian philosophy since the scientific revolution as a sort of Neo-Aristotelian, mm -hmm. because clearly a lot of things happened there in the 17th, 18th, 19th century uh, in our understanding of nature. And there are, there are, there are aspects of Aristotle's own thought which obviously had to be changed or, or abandoned in light of all that. 
And Aristotle himself would have been the first to do that. He was a he was an empiricist, right? He, mm -hmm. uh, he he put together theories that were really excellent explanations for phenomena of his time. But once we learn more about the heavens, let's say, I mean, he would have modified it, right? I mean, he was rightly impressed with the regularity of the heavens, the fact that they keep going around in exactly the same way over and over again. And so it was very natural for him to infer from that that they were eternal and unchanging. Uh, and that was a very simple and a plausible hypothesis at the time. But now, of course, we know that's not the case. So, so the question then for Aristotelian since the scientific revolution is what uh, can we keep? What do we have to change? And I think those of us who call ourselves Neo-Aristotelians um, think that the fundamental things in Aristotle are still viable. And the things that we, we, should, have to, we should abandon are actually things that Aristotle himself would have thought of as secondary and tertiary ideas, not really as fundamental for his, for his system. Right. So the core of Aristotelianism remained, even though the scientific revolution had kind of changed our conception of physics and how motion worked and so forth. Yeah. And I might just add that, and I'll get to this a little bit later, um, a lot of the work I've been doing the last 10 years, especially, has been um, applying Aristotle's framework to very recent, well, fairly recent uh, science, especially the quantum revolution. And, and I think, in fact, that Aristotle's philosophy fits the quantum revolution very well. And if, if, we, if we could have jumped right from Newton to Bohr in the 17th century, everybody would have stayed in Aristotelian because they would have said, well, this is actually what we need. Uh, the, the most important thing I think that changed uh, with, with the quantum revolution is that it brought potentiality back into the picture. So when you go from the classical philosophy to Newton and, and to Einstein, at that point, there really isn't any need for potentiality. You can just describe the actual world and some mathematical laws that tell you how that, how that natural world uh, moves through time. And you don't need to talk about potentiality. But once you get to the quantum revolution, suddenly there's potentiality out there that can't be ignored. And so, in fact, um, Aristotle's philosophy is a better fit with our modern scientific understanding than the kind of materialism that has been dominant for the last 300 years. Uh, you know, I've heard also, uh, you know, Aristotle's theory of change kind of summarized by Edward Fezzer that, um, and, you know, an object changes when their potential is actualized by an actualizer, right? right. Something like exactly. that. And there's a question here about, well, what, okay, so we're using these terms potential and actual and so forth, but yeah. like, what do we really mean by a potential? And what do we really mean by an actualizer and something actual? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I guess I could go back to the beginning here. Um, when Aristotle was writing, there were philosophers who, who actually denied there was any change at all. And uh, Parmenides and others. And their argument was, well, where could the change come from? I mean, if, if, it, if it comes from being, then it's already there. If it comes from non-being, that's impossible, so that nothing can change. And Aristotle's answer was that, well, there's two kinds of being. There's actual being and potential being. So change can be a, something that transitions from potential to actual or actual back to potential. And it's, it's really a, a common sense notion, right? It's not so much that Aristotle's inventing something here, but he's clarifying something and making it, bringing it to a center of our, of our attention, our focus. Uh, so, um, you know, someone who doesn't know French learns French. Some kind of potentiality for speaking French has been actualized as a result. Uh, a ball that is not frozen is frozen and uh, breaks. Some potential it had for breaking and for being frozen were actualized by the process. So it's a very, it's a very familiar notion. Uh, and um, again, what, um, what quantum revolution tells us is that in explaining the actual world, we have to take into account all the different potential changes that a thing could, could have gone through. All the, in, in the case of the quantum particles, we have to look at all the potential paths a particle can take from point A to point B in order to explain all the phenomena. And that's really new, the quantum revolution. Um, so you'll see, for instance, um, non-Aristotelian philosophers, when they, when they try to cope with the quantum world, they fall into things like the many worlds interpretation, I don't know if you've heard about this. Mm -hmm. The thought is that every time you interact with a quantum system, you actually split into two people, one who sees the spin up and one who sees spin down. And this keeps happening. So we're constantly splitting into more and more versions of ourselves. And there's billions and trillions and quadrillions of, of swans and me out there somewhere experiencing worlds different from what we've experienced. Well, the reason they're forced from that kind of crazy view is that they don't distinguish between actual and potential. As from an Aristotelian point of view, all those different things are potential. So they're part of reality, but they're not actual. 
there's only this world, right, that, that's fully actual. It's the central, uh, most real part of, of the world. And, but there are all these other paths that could have happened. And that's, that is also a part of reality. But, it's, but we have to distinguish at a really deep level between what actually happened, what merely could have happened. Right. And when you're discussing these people who uh, can't acknowledge potentialities, you're talking about the materialists, right? Like the, those who only yeah. believe in the actual, right? And then, uh, like, I don't know what their theory of change would be at that point. Uh, yeah, they have what they call an at-at theory of change, which mm -hmm. means that um, to, to change is just to be at a different position or at a different quality at different times. So you just plot the motion of the cannonball on a piece of paper, right, with, with time as one dimension and, and distance as another dimension. And you just look at that path and that's motion, that thing on, on the paper, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and from a philosoph from an Aristotelian point of view, that's confusing the map and the, and the real territory, right? So it's confusing a mathematical representation of change with, with the reality of change. And uh, for an, from an Aristotelian point of view, you can't really make sense of change until you think in terms of, of potentialities being actualized. Right. So before we get into the, uh, the full case for Aristotelianism, we already had like a little bit of a primer on it. Yeah. I want to talk about too, like, uh, so Aristotelianism is often associated with Thomism and essentialism. And I was wondering if you could kind of also explore the relationship between these uh, ideas and really kind of like their distinguishing features. Sure. Okay, so Thomism, of course, refers to Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century doctor of the church, saint, uh, who, um, and I think we use Thomism, I, I think we would use Thomism to refer to the theology of Thomas, because Thomas was primarily a theologian. Um, but he was also an Aristotelian, and so he, he incorporated Aristotle's philosophy into his theology in various ways, in ways that... Um, uh, well, I think we're very illuminating and helpful. So to be a Thomist is to be an Aristotelian, really. Um, but not vice versa necessarily. I mean, you can be an Aristotelian without being a the Christian theologian, certainly. Uh, so that's, that's roughly how I make that distinction. Um, and of course, there's also the question of, of Thomas's interpretation of Aristotle. There are many, there's different interpretations out there. Uh, I, I find Thomas's interpretation very plausible myself. It's a very, I think, charitable and, uh, you know, uh, helpful interpretation. Um, of course, he does see Aristotle as closer in some ways to Christianity than other scholars might. So he thinks that the kind of God that Aristotle can prove is compatible, at least, with the Christian God, the God of the Bible. He also thinks that Aristotle's view of the soul is compatible with mortality of the soul. And Aristotle himself seemed to be leaning that way, although he didn't commit himself in, in any of his writings. Um, and, um, now, you know, there were a couple things which, which Aquinas thought Aristotle was wrong. Relatively few, actually. <laughs> uh, most important was that Aristotle seems to have thought that you could prove that the universe had no beginning in time. Hmm. And Aquinas thinks that you can't prove that philosophically, because of course he thought that in fact the world was created in time, by, according to Genesis and, and the other church fathers. Um, but I think he's right that, that really Aristotle wasn't even considering the possibility of creation, or he was just describing a world you know, sans creation, and then such a world would not have a beginning or an end. And Aquinas actually thought that was possible. Um, now, essentialism, um, certainly any Aristotelian is an essentialist in some sense, but what does that mean? Um, again, I think essentialism is really just common sense. It just is the view that things have natures that make them what they are. That's the basic idea. Um, you do find some philosophers in ancient times and also in the middle of the 20th century who said they were anti-essentialist in various ways. Uh, probably Quine, uh, well, the Norman Quine's most, most famous one. I, I don't understand anti-essentialism. It seems to me such a crazy view that <laughs> I don't really see how anyone can defend it. I don't think many people do defend it actually nowadays. Uh, even in among analytic philosophers, it's pretty rare to hear somebody defending an anti-essentialist view. Because well, I mean, what would, what would the world be like? I mean, it would be it would consist of a bunch of what people call bare particulars, things with no nature whatsoever, uh, that then just take on properties at various times and then other times have different properties. I mean, what are these things like? <laughs> I mean, uh, if you suppose you thought, well, it's just some kind of, there's like this cosmic goo out there that's filled up in space, but has no nature. And then some kind of properties get glommed onto this goo to make them into different electrons or protons or whatnot. But I mean, even the 
goo would have some nature in order to be able to fill space. Right? That, that's a nature of some kind and to be able to persist through time in, in some way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think you can't really make sense of the world unless you bring in the notion of natures. Things exist, they have natures. Those natures are the grounds of their potentialities and the potentialities are needed to make sense of actuality. So it's all, you know, it's a very commonsensical picture, but I think it's in the end, it's, in the end, it's a, it's almost an inevitable picture. It's mm -hmm. impossible to avoid. Well, uh, so th there's a lot that somebody could ask about in, that, in this particular portion. So yeah. if you don't mind, let's just kind yeah. of explore some right. of the ideas that were presented. But first, uh, I, I think you might have to hold on to your mic like this, you know, okay. because it, it does rub against your collar. Yeah, the mic is right. going to be on the, you know, the bigger white part here. This yeah. one here? Yeah, that one's going to be the mic. So you want to kind of make sure it's not rubbing against anything. Okay. Okay, let's see. Yeah. All right. I think that should be better. Okay. okay. Does it sound all right? Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. Um, well, uh, uh, so there's, there's a lot that we could do. Well, one about essentialism. So I've heard uh, in, in David Otterberg's work, especially in his book, Real Essentialism, he talks about how, you know, we have to save essentialism from the quote unquote essentialists, right? So I, it, it seems yeah. to me that there's not a lot of homogeneity among uh, people who claim the essentialist title. So could you explain like kind of what is the debate in that camp or what, what, what does he mean by, you know, saving essentialism from the essentialists? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what he says. Um, okay, so um, I, I've got to go through a little history of 20th century uh, analytic philosophy, I guess. All right. <laughs> so, so again, if you go back to uh, the origins of analytic philosophy, like Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore and folks like that, um, they, again, w w took a view in which they, they basically tried to reject any notion of what's, not just what's potential, but even any notion of what's possible. It's just the actual world, that's it. So don't, don't talk about what's necessary or what's possible, just sort of describe the actual world. And, um, and that was uh, pretty dominant in the early part of the 20th century. But people found it almost impossible to avoid asking questions about what has to be versus what and what could be as opposed to what actually is. Right? I mean, again, it's part of our common sense view of the world. And as philosophers, you know, if, if, as we try to make sense of things, we have to ask, well, could this thing have been in this place? Could, you know, could a physical object have zero mass or, you know, these, these kind of questions that they're almost inevitable. Uh, and so we started to move towards uh, a revival of, of possibility or what's called modality in, in analytic philosophy in the middle 20th century, starting with Carnap, but then also Saul Kripke, probably the most important uh, philosopher here who provides a kind of mathematical semantics for modal or possible notions, notions of possibility and necessity, and that becomes extremely influential. Uh, and so you begin to have people talking about um, essences in this new kind of possible worlds setting. So you've got the actual world, and then we imagine various other ways the world could have been. We call those possible worlds. It goes back to an idea from Leibniz, so they can kind of lay fallow for a long time, and, uh, and uh, Kripke and um, Planting and others uh, kind of revive it in various ways. So, um, so you can talk about what's essential to me in that kind of setting. And initially, people were very reluctant to talk this way because Quine, again, to go back to him, had said, all oh, this essentialism is crazy, right? Uh, if, you, if you say that, um, this is a very politically incorrect example now, but his example was a two-legged cyclist, and, you know, a mathematician who was a cyclist, and he said, you know, qua mathematician, he's not necessarily two-legged, but qua cyclist, he is necessarily two-legged, right? Now we have people, cycles without two legs, but you know how it was back mm -hmm. then. So, uh, so he was saying, look, there's no, there's no possibility or necessity in things only in our language. That was a very traditional way to think yeah. about it in the early 20th century. But by the mid 20th century, people said, well, and especially Kripke, made some very strong arguments for why that couldn't make sense. So for instance, um, the fact that I'm identical to me, that's something that isn't true just because of language. It just doesn't make any sense to say I would be not identical to me, right? In any possible world where I am, I'm me, right? <laughs> that's, that becomes, that's sort of a, a principle of logic. And so people started to talking about essences in that kind of setting, but it was a very, initially a very thin notion of essence. Um, and in fact, 
someone like planning who's part of this movement of um, planning it, he does consider, well, I mean, maybe I could have been an alligator or, <laughs> or whatever. As long as it's me, it's okay, right? Uh, and so at that stage, we weren't really talking about, you know, the essences of kinds of things like human beings or water or electrons. It was more an essence of, a, of an individual thing. Uh, and I think that's the sort of thing that um, uh, Olu Oderberg is, is pointing to. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what we've seen actually in more recent years, thanks to a number of different developments, partly some work by Kit Fine on uh, theories of possibility, but also um, some developments in philosophy of science, where people are realizing that we do have to talk about the essences of kinds of things. So electrons seem to have an essence. They're all alike. They all have negative charge. They all have the same mass. They all respond to charge and according to Coulomb's law and so on. Um, now, there's, what's more controversial still is whether things like uh, living creatures have essences. Uh, and this gets into the whole question about you know, species and, and natural kinds in, in biology. Um, and you'll, you'll still today find some philosophers of biology will say, you know, there are no essences at all in, in the living world. But it doesn't make any sense. And when you look at what they and what the biologists actually do and say, they obviously think that being a living organism is a kind of thing, and that there are certain essential properties of being living that they, they, that they make use of all the time. In fact, the living things reproduce themselves, that they respirate, that they metabolize energy in certain ways. Uh, these are just universals of, of life. And even, even the notion of, of, um, of evolution really only makes sense if things have some sort of essence, because I mean, what's evolution based on? It's based on, on differential reproduction, right? What's reproduction? It's producing something of the same kind, right? Having the same properties, the same functions as the parent. And so you, you really can't escape uh, some notion of, of kindhood <laughs> in nature mm -hmm. that's independent of our, of our uh, language or our own psychological concepts or something like that. Some, some uh, relations of, of, of commonness, that are in, commonality that are in the world itself. And uh, so once you've got that and you've got this bodal framework, this framework of possibility and necessity, then you, then you can ask, well, what is it that makes it possible for electrons to undergo certain kinds of changes and not others? Why, you know, an electron and positron meet, they, they annihilate each other and turn into photons. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? Well, it's part of the nature of electrons to do that, right? right? And uh, <laughs> if you didn't have that essence of electrons, you couldn't make sense of that kind of phenomena. Right. And in your definition of essences, you know, you said it's the nature of that thing, right? Yeah. And I want to make sure that, uh, so somebody might say, I mean, so I see two responses, right? One is kind of like a skeptical response. Well, what do you mean by the nature of something, right? You're just kind of, you know, using answering one definition with another definition that requires a further explanation, if you will. Yeah. So that's one possible objection from a skeptic. Um, and maybe we should get to that first. But the second thing I was wondering about is sometimes, you know, I've heard people say, well, essence is what something is. But then when they describe what that something is, it sounds like they're talking about the form of the substance in question, right? Or the mm -hmm. form of the thing. And I'm like, okay, so how do you let's be careful here. So this is more like from an Aristotelian perspective, but first let's go right. to the skeptic, right? What? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, good, good. So, I mean, it's, it's true that, um, that nature really is just a synonym for essence, I think, in context. So it's not, it's not like this is a terribly informative answer, but I, I'm just highlighting the fact that this is, a, again, a familiar notion that we use in science and common sense and all that all the time. So, so look, here's, here's what we find, right? We find that the world is divided into things that belong to kinds, right? And, um, you know, those kinds are not arbitrary. We, we discover that there are electrons and protons and that there's water and hydrogen peroxide and so on. These are different substances, right? It's not, we're not sort of making it up as we go along, right? Mm -hmm. these, are, these are discoveries. And as we discover these kinds, we find that things belong to those kinds have certain predictable powers and potentialities. There are certain things they can do to other things. There are certain things that can be done to them. And there are certain conditions into which they survive and other conditions in which they cease to survive. And all of that is the nature of the thing, or there is something in the thing, let's say, 
in things of that kind that grounds these facts. And whatever that is, we can call their nature. Now, at that point, you're right. I mean, we can then get into some deeper questions about well, what does ground the name of these, these facts? <laughs> right? What is a nature, right? Metaphysically mm -hmm. speaking. Um, and so here we do get um, three main answers, right? Uh, the Platonist, the Aristotelian, and the nominalist answers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, here I'm thinking primarily of the resemblance nominalist, actually, at this point. So the, the Platonist would say, you know, that there is this one thing called the form of the electron. And every individual electron participates in that form somehow. And that's what makes the individual electrons electrons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, Aristotle obviously is influenced by this, but he also is very critical of Plato's picture for several reasons, right? One is, well, this, this form of the electron itself is an immaterial thing. Right? It's not located in space and time. So it's going to be of a very different kind than any actual electron, right? And so how could something that is separate from all the electrons, that's immaterial and non-spatial temporal, how could it be the very essence of the individual electrons when they're so totally different, so radically different? And secondly, Aristotle says, you know, it's just not clear how this causation works between these immaterial, completely separate forms and the individual things. So what Aristotle does, I think, is he takes the forms of Plato and he multiplies them and localizes them. So instead of having a single form of humanity, there's multiple forms of humanity, at least one for each human being. And the forms are similar to each other in a very strong sense, in the sense that they are actually interchangeable or functionally equivalent. Each form is doing the same thing in its host, so to speak, as the other forms of that kind are doing to their hosts. And that's what makes all human beings similar. So there is, some, there is a kind of thing that's not itself just another material part of a human being, or an electron for that matter, which is the metaphysical ground or explanation for why the human being or the electron acts the way they do and have the potentialities that they do. That's the, that's the Aristotelian theory. And this, of course, isn't just common sense. I mean, this is, a, this is actually a substantive kind of hypothesis about how to make sense of the world. Uh, third sort of view would be a resemblance nominalist view. So on this view, look, you've just got the electrons, right? There's no form that makes each electron be what it is. It's just a sort of brute fact that they're all similar to each other. And we find a bunch of things out there in the world that are similar to each other, we call that a kind. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the Aristotelian is going to press back on that somewhat and say, well, look, are the two electrons similar because they have a common nature? Or do they have a common nature because they're similar? And the nominalist says the second. And then the Aristotelian says that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> because it, resemblance is something that depends upon some kind of commonness there. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's not as though you could just take two things that were like totally dissimilar and then slap similarity between them and make them be similar. That's just not the way similarity works. It's a, it's a consequent relation rather than a, a more fundamental kind of relation. Uh, so that's one argument. There's a number of other arguments one could give, a little, a little more technical, probably more than I could get into <laughs> today, as to why I think that's not the best theory. Um, but at this point, we're, we're deep in the, in the tall grass of metaphysics, right? That's right, <laughs> uh, we're, yeah. We're, I mean, in, sense, in a sense, all three positions agree that there's a kind of essence out there, mm -hmm. and they're just trying to give different accounts as, as to how that's possible. Right. So I, we were originally trying to kind of hold off on uh, making the case for Aristotelianism, but I think, you know, yeah. we should just go right into it. So we've already kind of teased out right. a few arguments. Um, to start off kind of making the case for Aristotelianism, right? I, yeah. I'm reminded of your paper, um, what was it, the ontological ontological and epistemic superiority of hylomorphism or something mm -hmm. like uh, something like that yeah. uh, I mean do you want to start there by discussing the arguments of that paper or how would you make the case really for Aristotelian metaphysics well I might step back a little bit to talk about broader trends in okay the profession um, I mean maybe I can get that paper here in a bit I mean one thing well let's I think one place to start here is thinking about, uh, about causation. So we have roughly two or maybe three accounts of causation out there. 
One is the, uh, an account that derives from David Hume, various ways. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole neo-Humean program that's been going on for a while, uh, especially uh, driven by David Lewis at Princeton and his students now. Uh, and on this view, you, the world really consists of a kind of mosaic, so they like to put it, of, of inert qualities spread out across space and time. So there's a kind of four-dimensional block universe, uh, a bunch of inert qualities scattered across that, that vast um, canvas, and that's reality. So to get causation, you first have to find laws of nature in that. And on the human picture, the laws of nature are just regularities in that mosaic. So it's just a brute fact that we can certain, find certain patterns in that mosaic, and uh, that some of those patterns are very simple and comprehensive and enable us to encapsulate a lot of information about the mosaic, and those we call the laws of nature. And then causation is just uh, a byproduct of the laws of nature and, and the qualities that things have. So if something's really hot and something near it is cold, and the laws of nature say when they're in contact, their temperatures will move toward the average, then we can say that the hot one is, is heating the cold one and the cold one is cooling the hot one. And it's just a consequence of these laws of nature. So that's the human picture. Um, now, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with that. I mean, that became the dominant view for quite a while. Um, Bertrand Russell favored that kind of view, Wittgenstein did, uh, Quine, David Lewis, and so on. Um, but in, again, the late 20th century, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with that view in various ways. Um, for one thing, it seems to get the order of explanation wrong. So if I want to explain why this fire is heating this water, um, it, it seems that, um, that the fact that hot water's hot, fire is followed by hot water over and over again, that's not the explanation, right? But on the human view it is, because that's what makes it the law of nature. So, so in fact, it's the, from his view, the laws of nature are explained by the events, not the events explained by the laws of nature. And that just seems backwards. It's like you got the order of explanation wrong. Um, you can also point out that um, there are lots of difficulties with this view in terms of thought experiments. So for instance, suppose we had, uh, we've got electrons in this world, right? And they have negative charge and they repel other negatively charged things, right? So there's a thought experiment. Could you have an electron with negative charge in a universe where it's all by itself, nothing else around? Why not, right? Just erase everything else, there's the electron, no problem. But the human says, no, you can't have that. Because in a world like that, there would be no negative charge because there wouldn't be the right kind of pattern of events of repulsion and attraction. There's just the one particle. And so it's impossible for, for something with negative charge to exist in such a world. That just seems counterintuitive, right? And there are lots of other examples of that sort. Um, another reason that this became, people became dissatisfied with this was uh, the work of Nancy Cartwright, actually in philosophy of science, who pointed out that, um, that the humans are, are well, they've got science wrong. They think that scientists sort of sit around watching a pattern of events going by on a big screen somewhere, making notes and extracting laws of nature. But that's not in fact the way it works. Science actually works by interacting with individual things and by sort of isolate, isolating them from other influences and prodding them and poking them in various ways. So what we really do in, in experimental science is we explore the causal powers of things, not just look for or inert patterns in space and time. Uh, and that just doesn't make much sense on the human picture, whereas it makes perfect sense on the Aristotelian picture in which powers and potentialities of things are right at the ground floor. They're, they're really fundamental to things. So I think uh, that that made uh, Aristotelianism look a lot better. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, I think the quantum revolution uh, is, is evidence for Aristotelianism because the way that it brings potentiality and also in the way in which it it has bring a, brought a kind of holism back into the picture. So before the quantum revolution, everything was bottom up. Once you had all the little particles in space, you had everything. Everything else is just a byproduct of that. But the quantum revolution says, no, that's not right. As you get down to smaller and smaller levels, things get fuzzier and more indeterminate, not more precise and more definite. And so in fact, you have to have the macroscopic things are actually contributing uh, structure and form to the microscopic and not vice versa on the quantum revolution. And that actually fits very nicely with Aristotle's picture of the universe as a kind of multi-tiered um, uh, set of structures. So those are some, some uh, reasons I think for the, 
revival of Aristotelianism. We could also bring in things like uh, ethics, which we'll get to we'll get, I guess, guess in a mm -hmm. bit later. Um, in, in, in the philosophy of ethics in the middle 20th century, again, there was a turn uh, towards virtue theories. And uh, uh, Flip, a good, Flip a Foot and um, Michael Thompson and others. Um, and um, that has led people back to uh, Aristotelian notions also, again, of, of uh, form and uh, character, power, um, dispositions which uh, has helped with that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, I, I guess I could get into the hylomorphism sort of issue as well. Yeah. Um, could you explain so, first what hylomorphism is for the yeah, audience? Yeah, right. So, it, of course, in a way, hylomorphism is just another word for Aristotelianism, because yeah. as I said before, um, Aristotle's view is that there is such a thing as form, right? And uh, individual things have their own individual forms. Of course, when we're talking about material things, there's also a kind of material aspect, which is the stuff that the thing is made of. Right? And the form somehow unites that stuff into a single thing, contributes to it a certain nature, a set of potentialities, structures, and, and uh, makes definite that, that matter in various ways. And so hylomorphism is just, it's just Greek for matter formism, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's just another way of getting at the Aristotelian picture. But it's been, there's been a lot of interest in it in the last 30 years or so as a kind of third way of making sense of the mind-body problem. So traditionally, we've got uh, materialists on the one hand and dualists on the other hand, where materialists say, you know, following some of the cobs, there's just matter in motion. And what we call mind is just a way that some matter behaves. Right. Uh, there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, on the opposite side, you have dualists who th who actually had a very similar view of the material universe to Hobbes, uh, but who thought that in addition to all that material stuff, there was also some kind of ghostly, um, mindy kind of stuff, and that that was completely separate from the material world, uh, and there was some sort of interaction between the two. So both views, I think, have, have deep problems with them. Uh, the problem with dualism is, uh, well, there are a number of problems. I mean, there, there's a kind of interaction problem there. How exactly does the mind interact with the brain? And, you know, where are we going to find that interaction in the brain? Seems a bit mysterious. Um, it also has a danger, really, of dividing the human person in a, in a deep sort of way, so that my body becomes a mere uh, external vehicle for the mind, not not really part of me in the strict sense of the word. And that I think has some disturbing sort of ethical uh, consequences. Yeah. I mean, it, it means that things like rape and torture, um, you know, are, are just sort of like vandalism, right? <laughs> You're messing with somebody's property. But, you know, it seems like there's something more going on there that uh, the divorce can't really explain. And on the other hand, materialism, I think, has had a lot of problems. Um, George Beeler and I edited a volume um, about 2010, I guess, called The Waning of Materialism, brought together a bunch of cutting edge, I think, articles e even then and on, on difficulties with, with materialism. Um, I think there are many different problems there. So hylomorphism is a, is a third way in a sense, because it says that a human being is not, does not consist of two substances, two things, a soul and a, and a body or a mind and a body, but really just one thing, Right? which has this formal and material aspect to it. And the, the form then doesn't have to interact with a second thing, which is already complete and, with, and already has its own nature, right? On the Aristotelian view, the body has no nature until the soul is there, right? The soul is informing your body into a living thing of a certain kind. And so there really isn't the same kind of interaction problem there or a problem of how you pair the right soul to the right body. I mean, each, each living body has its soul, not mm -hmm. necessarily. And that soul is making that body into a living body and giving it the form and nature that it has. And so, um, and so you, can, you can, I mean, from, from a hylomorphic point of view, it's not surprising that we find strong correlations between mental activity and brain activity, let's say. Mm -hmm. That's what you would expect. But at the same time, we don't reduce the mind to the body, anything like that. 
or certainly we don't reduce the psychological to the physical, uh, even more importantly. So that'll give you a little bit of a taste of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what do you mean by a soul in this instance, or what would the Aristotelian mean by a soul? Kind of a unifying principle of the whole being, or what would it be? Yeah, so I mean, for Aristotle, a soul is just the form of a living thing. Mm-hmm. So actually, for him, plants have souls as well. Yeah. Because uh, any living organism has a form, any, any entity, any substance. Substance is, a, is what um, was, it's the word we usually translate for Greeks, uh, his, his Greek word, ousia, which mm-hmm. means a thing that's really there, right? Something that has uh, first class ontological status, right? Yeah. It has its own unity, its own nature, fundamentally. So the world is, is really made up of, of substances for Aristotle, for the most part. Some are inorganic, some are living. Mm-hmm. The ones that are living have forms which we call souls. And now for human beings, of course, the soul is, is special. This, this is where we start getting into the Thomism, especially mm-hmm. uh, because we have capacities of, of the human soul, the rational soul, which in certain sense exceed the capacities of the body. That is, we can understand universal truths. Uh, and uh, Aristotle argues, and Aquinas also agrees, that this involves um, a kind of power that is, in a certain sense, separate from the organs of the body. And so that's, that's unique. And so in, in, there's a sense in which you might say, you know, talking about the soul for the human being makes a certain kind of special sense because it is, as, a, as Thomas says, a subsistent soul form, as opposed to all the other forms of all the material things in the world that aren't subsistent. So there is an important difference there. And that, that's why Thomas thinks that the soul can exist without the body, which is unique. No other kind of form in the material world could exist without, without the material part. So the form of water can't exist without water. Right? Mm-hmm. Without, yeah. without material water. Uh, the form of a tree can't exist without the bark and, the, and all that. But the form of a human being can exist without the human being because we have these special kinds of intellectual capacities that aren't yeah. reducible to the body's function, uh, body's operations anyway. Um, so, but in any case, in, in all of these cases, again, the form here, the soul, is something like Plato's form, the thing that by which a thing has the nature it does, by which it has the powers it does. Um, but the difference is that for Aristotle and for Thomas, each thing has its own individual form. Each living thing has its own individual soul. There's not just a single human soul, which we all share. Mm-hmm. Each, each human being has its own soul. But those souls are all, those human souls are all functionally interchangeable. They're all doing exactly the same thing in each human being as, as the others are doing. All right, so before we move on to talk about morality, I want to just entertain maybe four quick objections that somebody might be having in the back of their minds. Yeah. So the first might be, well, look, these are nice heuristics, nice little language games that we're doing, but we're ultimately just, you know, playing uh, with words and using concepts to somehow make sense of things. But we don't know, really, if these words are correlating to some real reality, if you will. These are just language games. Yeah, so it's a, obviously there are some worries here about, about metaphysics. Um, I mean, I think of, there are different ways of thinking about this. I think of metaphysics as at least largely very similar to theorizing in other branches of science. So, you know, if I were to lay out for you a little lecture right now about quarks and electrons and photons and so on, you could say, well, it's a bunch of mind, a bunch of language games you're playing, a bunch of words you're throwing <laughs> around, what the heck does this have to do with reality? I say, well, you know, let me explain. You know, there's actually data out there which this theory helps to explain in a very elegant and simple sort of way. Mm-hmm. I would make a similar kind of claim about Aristotelian metaphysics, that, it, that the parts of it that are admittedly, I mean, much of it is, well, it's all grounded in our common experience of the world as human beings. Uh, but clearly, some of it goes far beyond that, right? I mean, none of us think about form right? <laughs> uh, as, as, an, as an entity in the world. So that, I think, is, is something like a theoretical postulate, like quark or gravitational field. And so the justification for it is going to be its ability to explain and make sense of a wide range of phenomena. And, you know, it's taking me a long time to explain all the phenomena I think that it explains. Yeah. 
very helpful in, in, I think, in clarifying and explaining data in science. It makes sense of things like human agency, free will, plays a role in, in ethics and epistemology. So it's a, it, has, it just has a very powerful and very unifying, um, and ex, I would say explanatory function. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's roughly how I would defend it. Right, and then maybe another objection. So I remember uh, in Edward Fazer's debate with Graham Op uh, Oppie, uh, Graham Oppie, he said something like, uh, well, look, at the bottom of reality, there are just like these physical simples, right? So these basic physical entities that make up other entities or whatever, and these things require no further explanation, just kind of a brute fact. These are the simples that exist at the bottom of everything. Yeah. How would you engage somebody who thinks that talk of essence, talk of, you know, ness, if you will, the suffix on anything is just, uh, it's, it's useful, but really there are these physical symbols at the bottom of reality that have no further explanation. Right. Okay. Two lines of attack there. One, yeah. I would say that Oppie's physics is just out of date, right? He's working with a kind of Maxwell Newton picture of the world. Uh, and it's just not consistent with quantum theory. Uh, there aren't simple things out there that are the ground of all reality. There is this vast sort of network of interacting things that can't be separated into the ind individual bits anymore. So, so it's just out, scientifically outdated. But secondly, I mean, let's just, I'll just assume that that's wrong, right? Assume that he's right. And we will go back to the old Maxwell Newton idea, their little atoms and whatnot. I mean, even there, I mean, I, well, let's I'll go way, way back. So Descartes had a picture of the physical world. Right, in which the world is just full of this completely uniform sort of natureless stuff he calls matter. And it's always moving around in, in various vortices and swirls and so on. And that's the kind of ground of everything. Well, of course, we found out that was completely wrong. Right? We found out that at the bottom, you have, you have very different things, electrons, and protons, and photons, and gluons. Mm -hmm. These are all completely different. Right? They don't act the same way at all. Well, why don't they act the same way? Why do, why do electrons act like other electrons and not like protons? Well, because they have a nature, right? <laughs> you gotta say something like that, right? And the, the nature of electrons are all common to other electrons, and protons common to other protons. I mean, why do we find things, why do we find that all electrons have the same rest mass and they all have exactly the same electrical charge? And they all respond to electrical charge in exactly the same way according to Coulomb's law and so on, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be some sort of explanation for that. And uh, Oppie doesn't give us one. And all right. all <laughs> I guess to the, the third and final objection, and then we'll move on to morality and really the juicier stuff. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, I have a friend of mine who is, you know, a Christian philosopher. Uh, and, you know, we both share the faith, but I approach it. I, I approach things from an Aristotelian Thomas perspective. He's an idealist. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, kind of speaking to him, first, what are your metaphysical arguments against idealism? And then second, I wonder, well, let's leave aside the theology for a second. Just what would, how would you go about addressing idealism? Or is it possible that you could have a marriage between idealism and Aristotelianism somehow? Yeah, this is complicated. Um, <laughs> I've been talking to some idealists recently. Yeah. Um, or theistic idealists in particular, right? Mm -hmm. I think that makes the most sense. If you're, if you're an atheist, idealism is pretty difficult to make sense of. I mean, where, how exactly does the physical world come into being at all, right? Whereas if you've got God, you have Barclay's answer, right? Some system of ideas in God's mind, and that, that gives a kind of coherency and a unity to the physical world. So I think that's the most viable alternative here would be a kind of theistic version of it. Uh, and and what, what it really ends up coming down to is the idea they will often press the idea that we're something like characters in a novel that God is telling to himself or something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, um, uh, and it's an interesting idea, but I just think that, I think they're pushing that metaphor, metaphor much too far. I mean, there's some analogy between me and Frodo maybe, but I'm real in a way that Frodo isn't, right? <laughs> and uh, I mean, God, I'm sure has all kinds of ideas about Frodo too, uh, but that doesn't make him into a real person in the way that it does me. So I don't know exactly, it's, it's not terribly easy to say what he's done for me that he didn't do for Frodo, but it has something to do with existence, right? He's yeah. given me some active existence that makes a difference. And, and then once you've got that in picture, then you've got to say, well, what does, he, what does this act of existence 
do, right? Well, it has to combine with a nature or an essence of some kind, right? This is Aquinas' notion of ex existence in essence. And, and, and now, um, so now I've got to have an essence. So, so now suppose, suppose we say, okay, so, so fine. There are, there are finite minds. We'll go all the way back to Berkeley, George Berkeley, right? There's God and there's a bunch of finite minds and that's it. No, no material world, really. Everything is just, it's just ideas in, in God's mind or in our mind. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it makes, how should I put this? It just seems to me that it's, it, it, it's a simpler picture of the world to suppose that the material things that we seem to see and interact with are really there. Mm -hmm. right? um, it, it just seems to me that it's going to be vastly more complicated to say, well, no, they're not really there. But don't worry, there's a system of ideas out there in God's mind that makes it all look like they're really there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I guess that's possible. But, uh, but I mean, why shouldn't I just take my experience it more at face value and assume that there really is this pen here in my hand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I've heard some people say that uh, the reason why they don't think an objective world exists is because of quantum theory or, I don't know, advancements yeah. in physics. I mean, I, obviously you've been doing work in that area, or at least you know the literature quite a yeah. bit. Uh, what would you say in response? Yeah, I think that that's based on some kind of confusion. So here's, here's my way of thinking about it. When the quantum revolution hit, right, everybody was committed to a kind of philosophical materialism in which uh, the world is deterministic and it's all bottom up, right? Uh, it's all very demo like Democritus or Descartes, right? Uh, and so the quantum revolution hit and said, wow, you know, things are not maybe deterministic. Uh, these little objects don't seem to have definite positions. Uh, and, and and so the reaction was, wow, then there's no reality there at all. <laughs> uh, because it doesn't, the reality isn't meeting the expectations that they brought to it, the materialistic expectations they brought to it, the sort of micro physicalist assumptions that they were bringing. Mm -hmm. to. And my view is, look, we should never have expected those things in the first place, right? And so in fact, what I think the quantum revolution does, it doesn't convince us there's no physical reality at all. What it really shows is that the physical reality we all believed in is in common sense before the scientific revolution, that's real. That's really what it's done. It's put that kind of stuff back in the driver's seat, so to speak. And this, is, this is the way Bohr understood it, I think. Um, that Bohr is saying, look, there's, the, there's our macroscopic world of common sense. That's the real world. And then there's the quantum stuff, which is a realm of potentiality that interacts with this macroscopic world in various ways. Mm -hmm. you describe that mathematically. So that's closer to being the right answer, and it's, uh, it's certainly the way that Aristotelian would think about it. See, I think that's just a misunderstanding of quantum theory based on frustrated materialistic expectations. Hmm. All right. So now moving into the section about morality. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to ask in, in the beginning, like, you know, how would you respond to skepticism and moral realism? But maybe if I could give my answer and then you assess, you know, how you, how you would approach it. So I think that one is... Uh, what was it, Ruth Schaefer, Schaefer Lando talks about just, or even Luis Antony, just how intuitive, you know, moral realism is. And it takes really a lot to deny moral realism. Yeah. Uh, so there's just a strong intuitive appeal to it already. Yeah. I, I think the second idea is that people make the analogy between epistemic normativity and also, yeah. um, you know, uh, nor normativity yeah. when it comes to human action and yeah. so forth, good and bad and uh, all that kind of talk. I yeah. mean, that would be kind of my beginning of a response. What would you say kind of yeah. to cap it off? No, I like both of those responses. I think those are important. Um, yeah, I, I sometimes use Sartre as an example of the second thing. So he was very skeptical about objective moral normativity, but on epistemic stuff, he was very dogmatic, right? <laughs> must be the right way. There's reasonable ways. There's unreasonable ways to do it. And so he wasn't, he didn't say, oh, just do your own thing, right? <laughs> when it came to the epistemic stuff. Uh, so I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, I think another thing I might say is uh, most people will, maybe they think they're more skeptical than they really are. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially in our culture today, um, you know, we've lost our moral consensus. So we don't agree about a lot of things. But people are very reluctant to say, I know I'm right and I know you're wrong. 
right? Because <laughs> that's sort of an offensive thing to say. So, and so we retreat to a kind of skepticism or relativism as a way of just getting along with each other. Right? Uh, but when pressed, people, in fact, still re react um, with moral indignation when they see unfairness, right? I mean, I've tried this on students who in, in my class would vociferously defend moral anti-realism in class. <laughs> and they'll come into office hour and I'll say, you know, I've decided to give you an F on this thing. <laughs> That's totally unfair. Explain to me how that works. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you know, we, especially when we're on the receiving end here, we, we all become moral realists. Uh, mm -hmm. the receiving end of injustice. I mean, I actually see a lot more these days, I would say a kind of hyper moral realism out there among students. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's sort of distorted. It's become a kind of political manichaeanism, right? So if you're on the wrong side of a political issue, you're evil, and if you're on the right side, you're good. Yeah. Um, and um, but that um, but that still reflects a kind of moral realism, at least. There, mm -hmm. there are real moral standards. I mean, and even if you're uh, even if you're somebody like uh, you know, you believe that morality can just be reduced down to evolutionary psychology, that doesn't that doesn't avoid the metaphysical questions about yeah. like the nature of reality, you know, why these norms and I think you talked about in your paper, cognitive normativity and so forth, all right. these other kinds of issues. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's difficult for the materialist to explain how we could uh, know any normativity at all, mm -hmm. cognitive normativity, um, or, or, or to explain it just in, in purely evolutionary terms as well. Um, we need, uh, as you say, we need, we need something more to ground that kind of knowledge. And here again, Aristotle had the right idea, which is you really have to think that the, that the kinds of forms that we're studying mm -hmm. uh, are literally present in the mind in some way so that they can be manipulated in the mind in ways that um, connect, in ways that it's not, they're knowledge conferring for us. Mm -hmm. Right, so let, let's move on now to morality. So, er, you know, Aristotle places kind of, uh, well, I, I'm, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. Uh, yeah. So I remember in David Otterberg's paper, The Metaphysic, Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Law, he discusses how kind of everybody takes for granted metaphysics when they're doing ethics. So yeah. they'll start talking about, oh, well, I think this is what's good. I think this is what's right. And then they kind of do metaphysics after the fact, if you will, yeah. but for someone like Aquinas, Aristotle, they begin with their metaphysics, and then that's how they understand reality, the good life, and so forth. So, yeah. kind of, can you explain how do we get from metaphysics to morality in this picture, in this Aristotelian picture? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I would modify what you say slightly there. Okay. Um, so, um, I don't think that Aristotle or Aquinas are actually deriving their moral theory from their metaphysics. That's not quite the right way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they do think that you can um, see certain fundamental moral truths uh, as self-evident and, and kind of build the moral theory on that. But they also, I mean, uh, I don't think they're thinking that the two are separate either, right? Um, so the moral truths that we discover are themselves things that the metaphysical theory is going to have to take into account. And, we're, and we'll have to unify with the rest of reality in, in a sensible sort of way. So that's where I would look at it. So I would say, in the end, metaphysics is supportive of morality mm -hmm. because it, it places morality into a context in which it can make sense. But it's not, it's not as though you have to derive your morality from the metaphysics. I think that's a bit overstating it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I also, also want to avoid the opposite extreme where you think that there two are completely isolated and unrelated kinds of endeavors. Um, yeah, the other thing I might say about natural law theory is I think it's something of a misnomer because mm -hmm. if you look at Aristotle or Cicero or Aquinas, the kind of classic sources here, um, I mean, you will find only a few pages actually on natural law and you will find vast sections on, on happiness and on virtue. Yeah. So it's really a happiness virtue natural law theory. And mm -hmm. with natural law, definitely the third uh, in, in significance. Um, what's most important for this view is uh, the notion of eudaimonia or happiness as the ultimate end. And the idea of virtue, uh, moral and intellectual virtue as necessary um, conditions of achieving eudaimonia. And then natural law just sort of follows from that uh, as um, the sorts of things that no virtuous person would even consider doing, 
those mm -hmm. are the things that are outside the bounds of natural law in this picture. So would you be comfortable calling yourself a classical natural law theorist, or is there a better title, do you think, to your ethical theory? Well, I mean, I don't, I, I don't object to that, but I just yeah. think something like classical moral rationalism or something maybe yeah. be better. Because the natural law, again, for, for all three of these people, and it's very explicit in, in Aquinas, uh, the natural law is just acting in accordance with reason. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to act against the natural law is to act contrary to reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really does boil down to that. Now, you're going to, you're going to ask me later about Kant. Um, uh, of course, th these classical people have a, have a richer conception of what reason is mm -hmm. than, than, say, Kant or Hume do. Uh, so so it, it, it's, we might, it might be better to say something like um, acting in accordance with or contrary to wisdom, uh, rightly understood. Um, mm. so the, uh, a full uh, comprehension of human beings and our place in the, in the cosmos. Uh, yeah. that, that's what we want to act in accordance with. So I'm interested in uh, kind of, well, so would you, would you agree with kind of David Otterberg and Edward Fazer when they talk about, for example, uh, the convertibility of being and goodness? So the basic idea... Sure. Of course. The basic idea here being like, uh, you know, if you have a triangle, right, and you know the triangular essence, and if I was to draw a triangle that had a crooked side, you could tell that that wasn't a good triangle because it didn't approximate what triangles are supposed to be, if you will. And that when something is closer to what it's, it's being, yeah. then that's how you can see its measure of goodness. You would agree right. with that kind of yeah, basic, right. yeah, okay. Right, that's right. Yeah, so, um, so this... You know, the, the, again, this, this notion of eudaimonia or human flourishing mm -hmm. uh, definitely involves reference to our nature, right? So our nature, when our nature is, is actualized fully, then we are happy right? and, and vice versa. And, and, that's, and that's, in fact, what we, are, what, are, what we are always striving to accomplish, whether we know it or not. We're always aiming to that, to that kind of actualization of, of, our, of our nature. So that's, that's right. Um, but again, to go back to the earlier qualification, mm -hmm. that's right in the order of being. That's right metaphysically. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in, in thinking through things from an ethical or moral point of view, that that's necessarily where you start. Right? I mean, it's far more obvious, I think, that, I don't know, being happy involves having friends and, and you know, uh, treating them well and so on. Uh, and, and it's only after I've collected a lot of data like that that I can start, then start to see, well, human nature must involve, um, you know, social relations in a deep way, right? Mm -hmm. So that yeah. friendship is the kind of thing that would, would fulfill that human nature, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, there's a, there's a kind of back and forth here between our metaphysical knowledge and our moral knowledge, right? Someone who is badly raised, right? And, and, and uh, didn't have much of an insight into moral truth would, have, would struggle to do metaphysics well. Right, because they wouldn't really be able to understand human nature very well. So it's not as though you could just take someone, kind of a marry the color scientist analogy here, right? Yeah. Marry the uh, metaphysician who's been completely deprived of any moral training, right? <laughs> <laughs> Learns all the Aristotelian metaphysics, right? Would she be able to deduce the right morality? Maybe not, right? Because she might be so bad, actually, at doing metaphysics, given her lack of moral foundation, mm -hmm. that uh, she wouldn't be able to do the metaphysics itself well. Huh. Well, that's a fascinating thought experiment. Uh, let's see. I mean, there, there's so many different directions we could go in. Uh, do you want to kind of maybe explore more uh, classical natural law theory, happy virtue ethics, or would you rather move on to some of the, uh, the rival theories that are there and kind of contrast them? Um, yeah, let me see if I can say something more, more fundamentally about, about, maybe I should say something more positive about that before we move on to the other okay. um, Right. So, um, I mean, one of the things I, I like about this approach, and you see this in, in all, and again, the major figures like Aristotle, Cicero, and, and Aquinas, is that you do start with a close observation of human life and how, how things actually work. So it is, it is sort of an empirically grounded, to some extent, uh, theory. And, um, and it would be very open, actually, to new information from people doing like positive psychology where they're studying happiness and that sort of thing, uh, or, or uh, you know, 
intercultural anthropology where we examine uh, you know under what conditions human beings flourish versus uh, conditions where they don't seem to flourish all that's all that's important um, but it, I think it does you know there are certain deep themes that start to emerge one is that human beings are naturally social or political animals uh, we're not just uh, pleasure machines pleasure maximizing machines uh, we're not uh, naturally solitary animals like maybe orangutans are. We're, we're highly social sorts of animals. And that sociality, of course, is deeply connected with our rationality as well. So our sociality is, expresses itself through speech and through persuasion and conversation and dialectic and all of that. So, so all of that leads to a conception of the good life as one that is social, as one that is um, sort of philosophical in the broad sense, where we're, we're dialoguing together and working together to understand things, and to a political regime which is um, republican in the broad sense, that uh, you know, we're going to minimize force and coercion, we're going to try to reach consensus, try to persuade each other as much as possible, mm -hmm. respecting other people's rationality, um, treating each other uh, fairly as, as part of a, of a common enterprise, right? Uh, recognizing the human society as, as having uh, a common good, which we all share in, uh, essentially. So all that I think is quite important. Um, and I think, you know, you know, none of that, didn't really mention anything much about law there. I mean, law is important, but, but it's a secondary matter, I think. Um, you know, a well-run society isn't going to have uh, lots of detailed laws about things that can be done and not be done. It's, it's going to rely much more on on virtue, common sense, prudence, and so on of the of the citizens. Um, actually, when Aquinas talks about the law, the positive law, it's mm -hmm. really primarily about socializing young men. Right? <laughs> how do you how if parents have teenage boys that they can't control, then the state has to come in and have some laws to help help keep them under control. So it's it's very much a, um, a kind of um, last resort sort of measure. Uh, rather than the first thing that one should go to. Um, and part of the problem, I think, has been in the 20th century that it was philosophers of law who made a lot of important contributions here, like John Finnis and others, and so mm -hmm. that to focus on law, right? Uh, and and uh, I think that it, it can be slightly distorting of the, the whole picture. Okay, so that was a great like wrap up. Let's now get into some of the counter theories that are there kind of pervading a lot of jurisprudence and cultural norms right now. So, I mean, a lot of people won't ever say that they're a consequentialist or utilitarian, but it comes out when, you know, kind of when they least expect it. So yeah. uh, utilitarianism is the idea that you want to maximize um, what, whatever your unit is for, I don't know, like, for, uh, you know, it might be happiness, it might be pleasure, whatever you want to call it. And then consequentialism if I'm understanding it properly, it's just the idea that you know whether or not you perform a right or wrong action based on something in the consequence or what results, the effect of the action. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not as though Aristotelians, um, classical natural law people think that consequences don't matter. Right? Obviously they matter a lot. Um, I mean, one of the most important virtues one of the four cardinal virtues is, is prudence or practical wisdom, which is all about figuring out how to get the consequences that, that are best in a given situation. So that's certainly important. But I think the, the problem with consequentialism is that it takes one good thing and says that's basically the only thing that matters in, in morality. Mm -hmm. So we'll forget everything else. Let's just ask about the consequences. Uh, and, and so the first thing to say is, well, why should that be the case. Well, I mean, there are other things to consider here. There is you know, the nature of the action that you're performing itself. There, you know, what, there's the question about the meaning of that action, what you're doing directly to someone else or to other people. There's questions about intentions. There's questions about rights and distribution of, of dessert. There's questions about um, uh, ultimate, uh, well, let's see, what else is there? Um, well, there's questions about how what I'm doing fits into a certain set of circumstances and institutions around me. So there's all these other issues that are relevant. And, and it would just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a temptation, I think, in philosophy, of course, to try to boil it all down to one simple thing. Or what they think it's a simple thing. Well, let's, just, let's just focus on the consequences. And, uh, and, and indeed, um, if, if you're Bentham, right, 
we will we simplify it even more. So just consequences in terms of pleasure or pain. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know that, that, that I mean, there's there's a hundred thousand con- counterexamples to this, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, from all different angles that one could bring as to why that's just an inadequate uh, moral theory. Uh, and uh, one thing that I would say is that. Uh, I think one of the best arguments against consequentialism is that it has bad consequences. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody turns into a consequentialist, it will be a disaster, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have to have these constraints that are built into, into virtue to keep you from rationalizing bad actions, right? So it's really easy to rationalize all kinds of bad things in terms of consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's, you know, people can easily rationalize cheating on a test, right? Because I'll get this good degree and then I'll do all these great things in the world and it'll just, you know, it'll all work out well. Yeah, but it's cheating, right? <laughs> and if you were, uh, and, you know, if enough people think that consequentialism is right, then they will act really badly, in fact. Okay, so let's toss out consequentialism and let's right. go with a stronger competitor, right? We have Kantianism, deontology. Uh, yeah. So we have the categorical imperative, uh, never treat another as just a mere means to your ends, but as an ends in themselves. Uh, there's also universalize your maxim, all these other different ideas yeah. that are in Kantianism. So how, yeah. you know, it seems, you know, growing up, uh, I heard, you know, these maxims being told to me and I thought, okay, these are fully reasonable, right? So how, how could yeah. a classical natural law theorist, I don't know, uh, disagree with Kant or differ in any way? Yeah. No, I think this is, this is a much better theory, in fact. Um, and the gap between Kant and, and the classical picture is not all that great, really. There's, there's a lot of overlap, um, especially if you look at some of the later Kant. So, um, I mean, I think the main defect that I would see in Kant is that the notion of, uh, of universalizability or just the notion of reason that he uses is too thin too formal, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what, being, what acting contrary to reason means for Kant is believing things that are contradictory, right? logically contradictory. That, that's really all he means by that. And that's, I think, too narrow a notion. Right? And a lot of people pointed this out. I mean, as long as you're willing to be a really, really consistent racist, Racism seems like okay, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or as long as you are a really consistent egoist, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, as long as suppose I thought, look, what's really good for the world is for things to go the way Rob Coons wants them to go. Uh, and I'm going to re- universalize that maxim. I want everybody back that way. That mm-hmm. seems perfectly fine, right? There's no, there's no logical inconsistency in that. Now, I think Khan would say, well, that's not what I meant. Um, but at that point, then, you know, he's going to have to appeal to a richer notion of reason, right? In which that's unreasonable. Mm-hmm. Right? just not pure logic, which I think in a way he did want to appeal to that, in fact. So I guess it's not so much that I disagree with Kant's sort of first order normative ethics that much, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of good stuff there, but the real problem is that he doesn't have the metaphysical foundations within which to make sense of it. Right? Yeah. So if I try to fit Kant's moral theory into his picture of the world, um, I don't, I can't see how that works, right? So for instance, he's, he's very skeptical about, uh, about teleology. Um, they're very skeptical about the idea that things have natural purposes, right? And um, though later, I think he modifies that somewhat when he gets to the critique of judgment, but, but initially he's pretty skeptical of that. Um, but then, you know, how, how, can you, how can I make sense of claims like human beings are social animals, right? They're meant to live in communities with each other. You know, only can, can make sense of that. It looks like, you know, again, if you, if you wanted to be a consistent misanthrope, that would be okay for him, right? Uh, and yet, uh, and because he wouldn't have the basis really for arguing that that was unreasonable. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we would recognize that like uh, someone who is kind of antisocial or wasn't able to really bond with the community, but they still follow the categorical imperative and yeah. universalize their maxim. We would say that still yeah. somehow they aren't reaching their full uh, flourishing. There's something exactly. lacking or deficient still nonetheless. That's right. So it's not that Kant- Kantianism is false. It's just it could be so much bigger and better and richer. That's the idea you're getting across. Yeah, that's right. All right. So let's see the next one then. Moral Platonism. Uh, so this has been around a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people, like probably the most popular contemporary 
uh, philosopher who endorses this would be Eric Wielenberg, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm afraid I don't know his work very well. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know this, this position very well. Yeah, so are you familiar with just like the concept of moral Platonism, though, kind of? Um, I think so, yeah. So yeah. The, the thought is that um, we just see certain moral truths the same way we see basic mathematical truths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's some, again, there's some truth to that, no doubt. I mean, there are self-evident moral truths in something like the way there are self-evident mathematical truths. Um, you know, seek, seek the good and avoid the evil and, uh, um, you know, treat equal cases equally and so on. So there are, definitely are some. I wouldn't deny that. But I, I do think that that's too thin a basis, again, to put um, all of morality on. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the fact that uh, Aristotle's view and Aquinas' view is, is more empirical than that. It's more open to insights into human nature and human functioning that we might acquire, um, you know, a posteriori. And we might acquire uh, even scientifically in various mm -hmm. ways or by, uh, or by reading good literature or something like that, right? deeper insight into, into human beings in a way that I think that the moral Platonists won't be able to explain. Um, and I mean, with the arguments from Aristotelian metaphysics, you could kind of hit moral Platonism in another direction, right? Because you discussed how moral theories have to kind of, based on their metaphysical foundations, also make sense of reality or at least be consistent with reality. Yeah. 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 I mean, especially if it's an atheistic moral Platonism. Yeah. Yeah. Or G.E. Moore kind of view. Mm -hmm. I, I find that very hard to understand. I mean, how, <laughs> how are we supposed to know these things, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a theist, you might be able to talk like Augustine does about kind of divine illumination, right? where God grasps these things and he illuminates our minds with them. But if you're an atheist, um, then I, it's really hard to see why evolution would care whether I got the moral Platonic facts right or not. Yeah. I'm not going to contribute to my survival in any way. Uh, and so it looks like you've got really good grounds for skepticism if you're, a, if you're an atheist on that, on that score. All right. And to the last ethical theory, the new natural law theory of Finnis, Boyle, uh, yeah. George, and so forth. I remember you wrote like a 77 page paper on, uh, with a, with a co-author on the issue of abortion, right, and the new natural law theorists. But, you know, we yeah. can go there or we can discuss kind of your overall critique of new natural law theory. Yeah, that was with Matthew O'Brien. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, well, it was tangentially about abortion. It was mostly about their theory of action yeah. and intention. So a big part of the debate among Thomists is the doctrine of double effect, right? So the, the idea that you can I can do something that has a bad effect uh, in certain circumstances, but I can't intend the harm directly, so to speak. So there are cases where I can't kill intentionally, but I might be able to do something that kills indirectly or unintentionally. Right? Uh, classic examples of this would be things like uh, uh, warfare, where uh, I'm bombing a legitimate military target. I realize there'll be some collateral damage. People will be killed. Uh, as a result, they're, they're not what I'm, I'm not intending their deaths, but I can foresee those deaths as a consequence. So it becomes a really important question as to what exactly do I intend on a particular case, right? And the new natural law view takes, I think, a, a quite an extreme view of this, which is that it, they think, they think you, should ne you can never intend to kill someone, even an enemy soldier in war. Mm. And so if you were to shoot an enemy soldier point blank in the head with a large caliber weapon, they would say, it's okay, but you're not intending to kill. <laughs> you're only intending to disable that soldier. Mm -hmm. And the death is an unintended but a foreseeable consequence of what you're doing. And Matt O'Brien and I were saying, no, you're doing something which is intrinsically lethal. And you know mm -hmm. that it's lethal. And so you are intending to kill, right? And so if, it, if we're going to say that that's justified, we have to say that in certain cases, you can intentionally kill uh, someone. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what we were debating. And the new natural law view, on my view, has two, two Cartesian, two dualistic conception of the mind-body relationship. Yeah. And so, um, so on their view, uh, their view, the mind is putting together its proposals on a kind of whiteboard in the sky, so to speak and say, I'm doing X for the sake of Y, for the sake of Z, for the sake of W. 
And as long as death of X doesn't show up on my whiteboard anywhere, I don't intend it. <laughs> Whereas we're saying, we were saying, well, when I act, I'm always ultimately choosing to actualize certain powers of my human person, right? And some of those powers may be acquired skills. So I may have gone to basic training to learn how to kill enemy soldiers in certain circumstances. Uh, well, when I choose to exercise those lethal capacities, I am intending to kill. The object of my thought, of my action, the object of my intention is an action which naturally kills. And therefore, I'm, I am intentionally killing on that view. Um, and I think that's the more hylomorphic, the more truly Aristotelian way of thinking about action. Um, that's what we try to argue in that. So I, I would say about the new natural law view um, is it isn't, well, let's say we go back. I mean, I have a lot of respect for John Finnis. He's a great mind. And he did something really important in the 60s, 70s, uh, in, in, in that at that time in the world of philosophy of law, no one took natural law seriously, no mm -hmm. one took classical things seriously. And so he helped, he really almost single-handedly, I think, with, with help of the others, but he's the primary mover, I think, uh, made it a, a respectable position and, and brought it into the debate. I think that's great. On the other hand, <laughs> that's a good side. <laughs> but uh, in, in, order, in doing that, I think he compromised the view along certain really important points, which I think uh, led to some serious defects in the new natural law. And the compromise is a kind of um, accepting a sort of Hume Kant kind of, especially yeah. Hume kind of uh, is ought gap, uh, a, a strict separation now of, of um, morality from the metaphysical and from the, and from the natural. Um, and partly as a result of that, you have a position that I think is very defensible. It's almost it's sort of designed to be an impregnable fortress, so to speak. It's really hard to attack, but it also has very limited persuasiveness to it. Mm -hmm. it really draw new people into the view very well, I don't think. So the what the new natural law people do is they say there are these basic goods, right? Like life and play and re more recently marriage. Mm -hmm. And so you um, once you grasp these basic goods, you see that abortion is wrong, contraception is wrong, um, uh, gay marriage is wrong, and so on. But they can't give any real arguments for the basic goods. It's a kind of take it or leave it proposition. Yeah. Here's the basic good. Do you see it? No? Well, it's too bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> wrong for you, right? Uh, you should, uh, whereas the more traditional view, as I said, I mean, if you read what, for instance, if you read what Aquinas says about marriage, contraception, and in the contragentiles, I mean, he starts with certain obvious empirical facts about human life. That human beings reproduce their, themselves this way. Our children are super vulnerable and dependent on their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a long time to develop a human being properly. You need a stable home in order for that to happen. And therefore you need, you know, one man, one woman, woman in a permanent relationship. So there's a, there's a, there's a chain of reasoning there that's, that's quite empirical in nature. It mm -hmm. reflects, reflects how human beings actually work. Whereas the new natural law people say, oh, forget all that. Just <laughs> marriage. That's a basic good. You, know? <laughs> yeah, you can start right there and, and you don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Which is great because then if I say, well, I don't get it, I'll just say, well, too bad. And then move on. So mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't refute them. But it's not going to persuade people that aren't already on board. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy with that in that respect as well. Well, okay. So with the, this final section here on applied ethics and political theory, let me try to just condense it down to three basic questions just to save time. Yeah. We're probably going to go over the 90 minute limit, but that's, I hope you don't mind. That's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, so the first question I think can just stand alone, which is really the question about, well, you know, you would identify as a conservative, politically, philosophically speaking, but what does that really mean? And how does that, how do you distinguish yourself from, you know, libertarians, you know, uh, you know, don't tread on me, a taxation is theft, and then contemporary liberals who, I don't know, they, they, they seem to have a very radical view of the world that is so diametrically opposed to the classical picture. Uh, yeah. How would you take those two things on? Yeah, well, I, 
In your original question for me, you said, you know, how would I distinguish it from other political ideologies? Yeah. So I was going to jump on that and say conservatism is not a political ideology. Oh, okay. Okay. It's a, it really is, I think, a set of virtues um, that characterize cons political conservatives. Virtues of prudence, loyalty, common sense, justice, rightly understood, tolerant, uh, uh, temperance, and so on. Um, and so, uh, you know, libertarians and, and leftists both, I think, have in common uh, a, a, a kind of geometrical approach to politics, you might say, where they think that they've grasped certain key axioms of liberty or equality in either case, mm -hmm. and that then they're going to just impose this, the theorems they've derived from those axioms on the real world, willy-nilly, you know, helter-skelter, without any kind of sensitivity to the uh, history, the organic set of relationships that have built up over time and all of that. Whereas conservatives think, look, we're, we're always, you know, in media race, as uh, Virgil says, right? We're always, we sort of find ourselves in the middle of a very large, complicated story. And our job is just to figure out how best honorably carry out our position in this very fast, complicated story and not to try to um, superimpose upon it some really simplistic, um, mm. quasi-mathematical yeah. preconceived notions of what's, what's going on. Um, so, you know, we, of course, I think conservatives should care about justice, right? The, the leftists are very concerned about justice, but, but, the, but the leftists have this, again, really distorted conception of what justice is. And so everybody has got to be equal in all respects or something. Mm -hmm. Well, conservatives think, well, when does that ever happen? <laughs> and, and would that even be a good thing? I mean, it's not, it's not clear that that makes sense given the way human beings actually work and how, we, how, we, uh, uh, you know, how human societies are actually organized. So mm -hmm. um, we think of justice more as a question of you know, giving people their due in the sense that, uh, uh, well, treating like cases alike, um, treating all human beings certainly with respect. Uh, but that also means respect, and this is, I think, a crucial difference between us and the other views, respect also for the past and for the future. Mm -hmm. So almost all the other so-called ideologies are really obsessed about the present, right? And conservatives are also concerned about our ancestors and about our descendants, right? So our ancestors were around, they, they, they created these ongoing projects, and they left them to us, uh, and they expected us to carry them on. Well, I think we should carry them on. It's a general rule. I mean, maybe if, if they're bad, we should abandon them. But if they're good projects, we owe it to our ancestors to keep them going. Mm -hmm. Just as we hope our descendants will carry on our good projects as well. Right? Because human life is, is not something that can be uh, limited to 70 years or whatever. Right? We, we, we're creatures of, of, a, of a historical sort where we can look back and look forward. And the meaning of what we do can't mm -hmm. be limited to. Uh, the confines of a single lifespan. Mm. That's, that's another sort of characteristic uh, perspective of conservatives, I think. And this kind of goes into your uh, paper on property rights and so forth, the metaphysics of property or something like that. Yeah. Uh, right. You discussed how you're, you're not approaching this from kind of an ahistorical perspective in the sense of I have a principle here about property or I have a, what was it like, a, you know, Locke's uh, state of nature heuristic. You're not trying right. to create just some abstract principles. You're really trying to get at social practice and communities and so forth. So could you discuss kind of your view on property? in a conservative yeah. perspective. Yeah, so I mean, it actually a lot of this does go back to something like Kant's uh, categorical imperative or Christ's golden rule, right? Mm -hmm. Others as you have them to do unto you. And so um, you know, we have these ongoing social practices that have existed before we were born and many of them will go on after we're, we're dead. Um, and a lot of people are invested in those things, right? So um, respect for them gives us pretty good reason to be loyal to those same projects and to contribute to them and keep them going. And now how does this relate to property? Well, um, property is really essential to any kind of ongoing social practice, right? Unless we're gonna have just a single unified state that runs everything, right? We're gonna have to have multiple institutions. So that we churches, schools, families, businesses, professions, and so on. Well, how are they going to be able to interact with each other unless they have some kind of stable property rights, right? They're going to, they have to exist 
in a physical world. They have to take up space and time in order to do their activities. And so um, if, if I find, you know, here's this family that's been farming in this part of Kentucky for generations, that owed, I owe that a lot of respect, right? Uh, I'm not going to say come in and say, I'm sorry, we're throwing you out and building a shopping mall or something. I mean, they've got a right to that that's built into that ongoing practice. Mm -hmm. uh, if a college has been off functioning for hundreds of years in this little place, I'm not going to come along and say, sorry, you can make better use of this property, move, move, move away. We have to respect that as well. Um, and so, uh, so property is just a consequence, really, of respect for existing practices and the investment that people have made in those practices. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I have to try to, if I, if I want to do something completely new, I've got to try and find some way to negotiate all these existing activities. Uh, I can't just run roughshod over them. Now, to the last question. Uh, so, perhaps for the audience, they might think, oh, we'll bring in the issue of abortion right at the end when we were talking about property rights and everything. That just seems to be shoehorned in, but it actually has a real implication here because, you know, Judith Jarvis Thompson's defense of abortion deals yeah. with this conception of property rights and so forth. Yeah. And I, I wanted to kind of close my off body here. And all that kind of stuff. What'd you say? Yeah, my body is my property. Yeah, my body, my choice, whatever, all this sort of thing. So, I wanted to kind of leave off here on a on a maybe controversial note, keep the audience interested on really, based on the conservative conception of property, how does this affect an issue like abortion and autonomy? Yeah, right. Yeah, so I, I mean, respect for liberty or autonomy is important, but it presupposes a more fundamental commitment to life, to human life. Why do we care about autonomy? Because human beings are the kinds of things that need autonomy, right, uh, to a certain degree. And so, it, it, you know, the, 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 the right, so to speak, of human beings to live is the fundamental right. A right to liberty or autonomy is secondary to that. It's derivative from that. And so, um, so yeah, when you're talking about the right to uh, do something that's um, violent to another human being, or an activity that's violent to another human being, that's, that's something that's going to be very difficult to justify, right? especially if it's an innocent human being. Um, and um, property rights just aren't going to trump a uh, more fundamental human right there. Another thing you know, to point out against about Judith Jarvis is that Thompson is that you know, she treats the relationship between the mother and child as though they were just strangers meeting in the subway or something instead of a mother and her child. And that's obviously... Again, given the nature of human life, that's a very important relationship, right? Mm -hmm. A fundamental relationship to, to the perpetuation of the human species. And so, um, you know, there are obligations that a mother has to a child or a child to its mother that are not, um, not going to be made sense of by, again, a Lockean state of nature or some kind of, a, again, more abstract uh, moral theory. Well, let me thank uh, Dr. Robert Coons for coming out and talking tonight to Intellectual Conservatism. I mean, this is really an exciting interview. Uh, would you be open to maybe like future discussions on other issues like the existence of God and some of the work that you've done with Alexander uh, Pruss or Pruss rather yeah. uh, in, you know, the principle of sufficient reason and so forth? Yeah, and I'd be happy to. I'm actually doing a graduate seminar on that right now. So yeah, I've got a lot of, a lot of ideas there to share. All right. Well, that's amazing. So thank you for watching this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Dr. Coons, before we go away, do you want to say any last words uh, to the audience before we end the episode? Well, I just want to thank you uh, uh, for this opportunity. I think you're doing great, great work. And I hope, hope people will follow, this, uh, follow your work closely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Coons.